Well, hello, hello, hello again in the Committed 100 land. Welcome to Church History as we look at New Testament apocryphal books. Last week we looked at Jerome and the, the uh, his translation into the Latin, the Latin Vulgate, and his exclusion and inclusion, sometimes, although by protest, the Old Testament apocryphal books, um, due to his studies with the Jews there in Jerusalem and their rejection of those apocryphal books. In the same way, now in the New Testament period, we have many apocryphal books that have been considered by some as being purposely left out of the Bible that and that they should be there. And we're going to look at a list of these, an examination of some of them of why they were not included, as well as take a small journey into what are the 27 New Testament books that we have today, the ones that are included in, in our Bibles. Why do we not have, for instance, the Gospel of Thomas or the Gospel of Mary in our New Testaments? With that, let's dive right in. So what are some of the books that are considered New Testament apocryphal, apocryphal writings? Uh, some of them are called the Gospel of Thomas, the Prayer of Paul, the Secret Book of James, the Gospel of Truth, Gospel of Philip, Origin of the World, the Exegesis of the Soul, Sophia of Jesus Christ, the Gospel of Mary, the Gospel of Judas, and some 50 other more. Most of these not being found or resurrected again and until the last 200 years in which some of the archaeology that has gone on has found some of these rather obscure, quote unquote, writings which claim to be scripture. The first one I want to look at today is the Gospel of Judas. This came out recently. There's been several books and translations of the Greek texts in which um, float around in the Gospel of Judas. It's called the secret account of the revelation that Jesus spoke in conversation with Judas Iscariot. So supposedly this particular gospel is Judas's side of the story. Now, I don't know how Judas would have had the time between the betrayal of Jesus to his um murdering himself by hanging his suicide to write said gospel. Um, we do not see any evidence of this particular quote unquote gospel before the fifth or sixth century, at least that's pretty generous dating for the documents that have been found. We don't see any copies as being accepted anywhere else in churches east or west of the Gospel of Judas. In key passages, Jesus tells Judas, you will exceed all of them, speaking of the disciples, for you will sacrifice the man that clothes me. Um, in other words, we have to remember that Jesus was the secretary, the treasurer of the group, and he held the purse strings. And then in order for Jesus to have money for certain items that he would have had to um, deal with Judas and the purchasing of uh, hotel rooms or clothing or necessities for the ministry. In the same way, the Gospel of Judas apparently also records that Jesus had secret little meetings with Judas. Step away from the others and I shall tell you the mysteries of the kingdom. Look, you have been told everything. Oh, so Judas, you know, knew everything about the kingdom. Okay. Lift up your eyes and look at the cloud and the light within it and the, and the stars surrounding it. The star that leads the way is your star. So here we start to see the gospel of Judas having a lot of mysticism. This, I believe, is an influence of Kabbalah in the early aspects of the early centuries of the church. Um, there are some Gnostic or dualistic tendencies within the Gospel of Judas that lift up your eyes and look at the cloud and the light within it. Well, just clouds, 
do the clouds that I'm looking at now, right now outside my window have light in and of themselves? No. Because the of the moisture content in them, they reflect some of the light that comes from either the stars or the sun. The star that leads the way is your star. Where else in scripture do we ever read of astronomy in the sense that we have our own stars? The only astronomy I know is God created the heavens and the earth and the stars and he knows them by name, but only he knows the name. Where else does he tell Abraham, Isaac, or Jacob, or any of the other disciples to look at a particular star and that it's theirs? What's funny is that Irenaeus, in 130, he lived 130 to 202, actually mentions this particular uh, quote-unquote gospel um, in his writings against all the heresies that were going on in his day. Others again declared that Cain derived his being from the power above and acknowledged that Esau Korah, the Sodomites, and all such persons are related to themselves. On this account, they add that they have been assailed by the Creator, yet no one of them has suffered injury, for Sophia was in the habit of carrying off that which belonged to her was from them to herself. Um, speaking of that gospel of Sophia, Sophia of Jesus Christ, um, becoming one of the early cults of the church. They declare that Judas the traitor was thoroughly acquainted with these things, speaking of these secret teachings that, that Sophia and others had, were privileged to, and that he alone, knowing the truth as no others did, accomplished the mystery of the betrayal. By him all things, both earthly and heavenly, were thus thrown into confusion. They produce a fictitious history of this kind, which they style in the Gospel of Judas. So here Irenaeus, living just that first century past the apostles, and yet he clearly saying that this gospel in which is being projected as, as Judas's as being heresy, as being absolute nonsense, in which we see, if you were to read, there's uh, copies of it available for free online, translations of this gospel of Judas, in which you see its very nature as being not in the same style as the Gospels, but of propping up as G uh, Judas as being some of some sort of demigod or some sort of hero in the story. We come once again to the Gospel of Mary. Peter answered and spoke concerning these same things. He questioned them about the Savior. Did he really speak privately with a woman and not openly to us? Are we to turn about and all listen to her? Did he prefer her to us? So in other words, uh, supposedly in the Gospel of Mary is pitting Mary and Peter against each other about who is leading the church in Jerusalem, which we know is really James and not Peter. But once again, the Gospel of Mary has that wrong. Then Mary wept and said to Peter, My brother Peter, what do you think? Do you think that I have brought this thought this up myself in my heart, or that am I lying about the Savior? Levi answered and said to Peter, Peter, you have always been hot-tempered. Now I see you are contending against the woman like the adversaries. But if the Savior made her worthy, are, who are you indeed to reject her? Surely the Savior knows her very well. That is why he loved her more than us. Rather, let us be ashamed and put on the perfect man and separate as he commanded us and preach the gospel, not laying down any other rule or other law beyond what the Savior said. And when they had heard this, began, they began to go forth and proclaim and to preach. To preach what? That Mary's the head of the church. Apparently, from the gospel of Mary. And yet, in the recording in Acts, what is it that they preached Christ and him crucified. Not that Mary was the leadership of the church. There's not a single iota of 
textual evidence of any of, of the authentic New Testament documents that place Mary as being the leader of the church in Jerusalem or in Judea at any point in the first century. Period. End of story. Not even debatable. He continues, and when it said this, the soul went away rejoicing greatly. Again, it came to the third power, which is called ignorance. And when the soul had overcome the third power, it went upwards and saw the fourth power, which took seven forms. This is speaking of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The soul of Jesus went away rejoicing greatly. Again, it came to the third power, which is called ignorance. And some count, some way somehow overcame the spirit of ignorance and when it overcome it, it went upwards and saw the fourth power and and now this one soul took on seven different forms the first form is darkness and the second desire and the third ignorance and the fourth the excitement of death and the fifth is the kingdom of the flesh the sixth is the foolish wisdom of the flesh and the seventh is the wrathful wisdom these are the seven powers of wrath this is all Gnostic, spiritualistic writing, which can be traced to other writers of the early first century and the Gnostic teachings attributed to Mary in her gospel. Where do we see anywhere in the New Testament that describes Jesus's resurrection have, as having to overcome these powers of wrath that are things such as ignorance, desire, excitement, kingdom of the flesh, wrathful wisdom. Where? This is all heretical nonsense derived in the first century. We come then to what's called the Gospel of Peter. And as they declared what things they had seen, again they see three men come forth from the tomb, and two of them supporting one, and a cross following them. And of the two, the head reached into heaven. But the head of him who was lead, led by them overpassed the heavens. And they heard a voice from the heavens saying, Thou hast preached to them that sleep. And a response was heard from the cross, Yea. So in the Gospel of Peter, the cross speaks. Okay. I'm thinking whoever wrote this in the first century had a little bit too much, you know, first century weed or something. And it came with them, the elders and the scribes, to the sepulcher. And having rolled a great stone together with the centurion and the soldiers, they all together who were there set it at the door of the sepulcher. And they affixed seven seals and they pitched a tent there and guarded it. So, number one, how many guards? Two according to the biblical story, as well as Josephus. How many seals were placed upon it? One, the governor, according to Josephus. According to the Gospel of Peter, it says that there were many scribes and Pharisees and elders, as well as the soldiers. Centurion and soldiers, plural. So there's five, ten people guarding the grave. But in the account of the resurrection, who were there guarding it too? How many seals were there? One. But apparently, according to the Gospel of Peter, there were seven. And there was a tent and people guarding it. There are more historical errors and embellishments in the Gospel of Peter. That uh, seven seals are used to seal the tomb of Jesus. That a crowd from Jerusalem comes to see, see the sealed tomb of Jesus. Jewish leaders camp out at the tomb of Jesus overnight and that the Jewish leaders feared the harm of the Jewish people. This does not describe the historical situation of the Jews before the destruction of the Jewish temple in AD 70. The resurrection story actually describes how Jesus exited the tomb with two giant angels, a supersized Jesus and a, a talking cross, not the, the resurrection story we see in the Gospels and in the book of Acts. So what books made it into the New Testament? What books didn't? We could go on and on and on and on about these other Gospels. <laughs>
many of which have only been found in the last couple of centuries, many of which do not date to anywhere near the first century. There were three criteria as we look back at history that were believed by either the early church fathers or those closely afterwards, especially when you start looking at Athanasius and others and their lists of accepted books. One was apostolicity, a big fancy word, that it had to be a disciple or a close associate. That when we see Athanasius' festival letter, when we start seeing Hillary's list of books, that each of them they could point to or knew that they were written by a disciple or close associate. Were they orthodox? In other words, did their doctrine align with the others? Many of these books were rejected, number one, because we don't know who wrote it. But number two, we get crazy things like Jesus' soul overcoming the seven powers and one of them being ignorance. It's just, where does that fit in with any of the other books, not only of the New Testament, but of the whole scriptures, the Old Testament, New Testament together? And then Catholicity. In other words, the word Catholic meaning universal not the, the way in which we understand or often apply the word Catholic today, were these books universally used by the church? In other words, were these books used both east and west? Was it used in Alexandria? Was it used in Constantinople? Was it used in Ephesus? Were these books that were accepted used by the church all over the world? If it was just a local book that was didn't have copyings that went for generations and went from one church to the next church to the next church, they were rejected as being um, small cases. We see that previously with Jerome in suggesting a reading of the apocryphal for devotional sense or historical value, but rejecting them as being part of the canon because they were not Catholic. They were not accepted by the churches or by the bishops of the churches throughout the world. These are three of the main criteria, which then once we get to the Council of Trent, were used to receive the books. But even before the Council of Trent in the 1530s, we had already seen within the first, second, and third centuries canon list in which all held to apostolicity, orthodoxy, and Catholicity of these books. There are very few books that still to this day are under question of any of these three particular topics, one being the book of James, the letters of, especially the second and third letter of John, and the book of Revelation, are the ones that are predominantly challenged as to their apostolicity or catholicity but not their orthodoxy we see some arguments especially for the book against the book of revelation in the early centuries but that it continued to be a source of doctrine and faith for many of the early church fathers who unanimously said that it was john that had written it in the same way, many of the early church fathers believed that James had written the book of James and that John had written his two epistles, not a second John. These criteria we also must use and look at when we accept and believe the things that are written in the 27 New Testament books that we have today are writings for the church, the word of the Lord to the church. Not the Gospel of Judas or the Gospel of Mary, excuse me, or the Gospel of Thomas but the 27 New Testament books that we have today. And my hope and prayer is that this gives you insight as to the nature of our New Testament. We've looked at the process of translation. We've looked at the process of inclusion in the canon. And I wanted to explain a little bit about why these books that keep showing up as national bestsellers, translations of the Gospel of Mary and the Gospel of Thomas, Gospel of Judas, they're, they're, they're very popular, 
because they paint a vastly different picture. Many times it, them advocating for a, a black Jesus or advocating for a human Jesus or advocating for a communist or socialist Jesus. That the reason these have been become popular and the reason why people ask questions about it is because they don't know their history. And it's because they don't know the process by which the early church fathers and the, then those in charge of the church in the early centuries made their evaluations of the books in which we read today. Pray that God would bless you, that he keep you, make his face shine upon you, and give you rest this week, and stay tuned tonight for Nightlight with Dr. Howard, Pastor X, Pastor David, and myself. See you all then.